Hi, this will be then the, the third and last little installment on our section on um, being in the world, Heidegger's notion of being in the world, and it will focus on sections 15 and 16 of Being in Time. <clears throat> uh, I want to begin by reading a little passage from section 14. Uh, this is page 94, and it's uh, about 10 or 12 lines up from the bottom of the page. Heidegger says, That world of every day's that Dasein which is closest to us is the environment. Well, we're looking at being in the world. Uh, last time, we last in the last segment, we focused on being in. This time, I want to talk a little bit about the world. Well, sort of in between, uh, heading toward the world. But as he says, the, the, the sense of world that's closest to us is the environment. And that's what, what we're going to talk about. Um, okay, let's go back for a second. We were talking about being in, and we were talking about being in as inhabiting. So... Now we're going to talk about what we inhabit, inhabit and how that inhabitation takes form. Takes form. But I want to just dwell for a minute on that notion of inhabiting. What, what have we been saying? We've been saying that that's the fundamental character of our existence as the experiencing beings that we are. So if you want to know what, what, what the reality of experience is like, it's fundamentally like, it fundamentally is inhabitation. So that's in contrast to saying it's like vision. So you remember, even when we were first talking about that Manet painting, I was saying, you know, your relationship to your object or whatever is not just visual. And I was trying to bring out the affective and behavioral ways that you might be implicated in things and so on. Um, so I was trying to say, you know, yeah, vision, vision is what we think of. And you think that paintings are about visual surfaces. And, you know, that, that's, that's how we tend to construe experience. We think, oh, it's the visual apprehension of an object. That's, that's our most immediate assumption but that really um that's a really uh if i suppose it's a bit of a pun that's a really myopic view of experience that's a that's a very narrow uh, s uh grasp of what experience is like uh, so heidegger is trying to bring out this much more sort of full-bodied and robust sense of experience as in habitation he's trying to bring out the much um more potent way uh to be experiencing is to be inhabiting a world and and how much that sense of the visual apprehension of an object really uh kind of misses the point of of so much of what's going on in experience um so we that's what that's what it meant to introduce this notion of being in or the notion of inhabitation as the fundamental meaning of what kind of things we are. We are the kind of beings who inhabit situations. But So that's the being in part of being in the world that he talked about in section 12. Uh, now we're going to talk about being in the world. We want to know what's the world. Well, he says, uh, first and foremost, that's the environment. Let's think about what the environment's like. And he's going to talk about uh, a workspace. Um, and let me... Um, Okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to start reading section 15. And the first thing I'm going to read is, is he's going to say something quite similar to this point I just made about uh, it not being like vision. So he says, this is section 15, about five lines down. The kind of dealing that is closest to us is not a bare perceptual cognition, but rather that kind of concern that manipulates things and puts them to use. And this has its own kind of knowledge. I mean, so, again, normally we think of our experience as, we sort of think of ourselves as being back here in this uh, cognitive control booth, and we look out and perceive things. We might reach out and touch them, too, but we kind of think of this going out and gathering, censoring information, and we think of ourselves as this engaging in some kind of mental processing and so on. He's saying that, yeah, that, that, that really misdescribes the form experience actually takes. And as he says here, the kind of... Um, way of being a subject engaged in the world, an experiencer, uh, the kind of way that we most basically have that sort of engagement is a practical one, a behavioral one. He says, uh, the, the, the kind of dealing that is closest to us uh, is a kind of concern that manipulates things and puts them to use. And then he adds, this has its own kind of knowledge. So, the, the, you know, the, the, the most familiar way that we have of being in the world is knowing how to get things done. And we, we have what people call know-how. Uh, um, you know, what did I do today? I rode my bike to the park. Uh, I didn't go to a grocery store today, but that happens a lot. I talked to a friend. Um, I did some things with my son, you know, put him to sleep for his nap. I made him lunch. Um, 
probably wrote some emails. Um, you know, I, I think back on your own day and just try to think of some of the things you did. You know, one thing that that is noticeable to me in those things that I did is that I went up a street. Uh, so I, for, forgetting about the particular tasks, that would be interesting to talk about too, but just how I did it. Like I left my house and navigated city streets to go do other things, well, part, sometimes on my bike, sometimes on foot and so on. Um, and I know how to do that. I know how to get around. It's, it's interesting. I know how to get around other people. And there are lots of people that I passed, and we didn't have any fights. Uh, we didn't chat. We just each went about our, our own affairs, and everything was smooth. Um, but notice that that's actually, you got to learn that. Like my son doesn't do that. My son right now is four, and his current favorite thing is to run out onto the street in front of our house when a car is coming past and wave like this, like uh, wave a doll at the, or, you know, a weapon a stick or a gun or something at the person driving the car and try to catch their attention um which i think is not a great uh, pastime for him to have um but you know that's that's not what it's like when i walk up and uh, down the street um i, I don't, don't even really notice people and they don't notice me we're we because we, we know we know how to interact in a non non-challenging non-threatening non-confrontational uh and ultimately mutually uh comfortable way uh such that we define a space as a city street, you know. Um, what I, I want you to think there about how you've learned how to deal with people. You probably never, well, maybe you thought about it. You probably never thought about it at that level. Um, but you learned how to do it. You learned how to to get around in the world. Um, and you know lots of other things too. Uh, you know how to use money, I guess. Uh, um, maybe you know when, when you're, when you're, hungry you just walk into the kitchen and you make yourself a sandwich or you get a drink of orange juice or whatever you just go through those things pick the cup up pour the stuff in like you 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 can be doing that while you're sitting there being mad about what your boss just said to you or maybe you're talking to a friend on your phone that you have pinched under your shoulder or something like that uh, you can be wrapped up in something else you don't even have to think about it right? so you have a kind of know-how that is not a matter of uh, theoretical reflective cognition it's a knowledge of how the world works and how you interact with it that that's in your body in, in it's in it's instilled in your behavior as carried out in bodily ways but without your explicit reflective management so as he says the kind of dealing that is closest to us is not a bare perceptual cognition but that kind of concern that manipulates things and puts them to use, and this is its own kind of knowledge. Yeah, you know, you get on your bike, you use the cup, whatever. Use the city street. Um, and so he says, um, uh, in, the, in our present analysis, it, the entities that we're going to analyze, so he wants to know, so we started talking about being in the world. So we are starting talking about the subject, but now we're saying being in the world. So we want to know, well, what are things? What's the world like? So this is his root into it. He's asking, what's our most basic way of being involved in the world? And he says, that's being involved in our environment. And he's going to look at what the things are in our environment. And we're going to sort out what it's, what it's like to experience a thing environmentally. And that's going to start to tell us something about the meaning of the world or the meaning, the meaning of that with which we are engaged. So he says... In the domain of the present analysis, the entities we shall take as our preliminary theme are those which show themselves in our concern with the environment. So um, so now what you need to do is think about what it's like to do the kinds of things I was just talking about, walking down the street, getting yourself a glass of orange juice. Or, you know, he gives the example of someone actually at work, you know, like a carpenter with a hammer. So put yourself in a workshop, put yourself in your job. Uh, or whatever, and think about what that's like. And um, uh, he says, uh, on 97, th three lines down from the top, he says, he talks about the, the things that we mostly deal with. Well, they're not just mere things, right? He says the things, the entities that, that we encounter in our concern, and concern is, is a sort of a technical word he's using for the attitude we have when we're, you know, working on something. Uh, that's, the, that's the kind of attitude you bring to the world when you're working on something. He says, we shall call those entities which we encounter in concern equipment. Yeah, I mean, that's when you're, when you're trying to make dinner or something. Uh, you deal with the things around you, and you don't deal with them like a 
theoretical scientists saying, what are things? What is a being? You, know, you don't do that. Rather, you are in the kitchen trying to make supper and you are oriented to the things around you uh, according to the role they have in uh, allowing you to carry out that task you're going to carry out. And so the thing that's interesting, remember, do you remember when we were looking at that um, Manet painting, I was talking about how, you know, when you, when you first see the picture, you sort of you notice the woman and, and you're, you're held by her eyes, you know, it might only be later that you start to recognize what's in the background. And, and I said, even there, like in your everyday experience, you know, there can be people you just are never going to notice. Well, I want, I want to highlight that theme for a moment, right? The, the idea that stuff, there's stuff that may, you know, maybe making, having a physiological effect on the optic nerve, you know, but you're not, you're not noticing it. Right? I want you to think about that. So the thing that's interesting is that in, in your environment, let's call it the kitchen when you're cooking supper, you know, your eyes are open, your ears are open. So you got your sensory apparatus on full. So there should be this massive, you know, pouring in of uh, seeing the cupboard, seeing the handle, seeing the refrigerator, hearing the dog barking, hearing all this sort of stuff, you know. But that's not really what the form your experience takes is like. Really, most of that stuff is actually kind of hidden from you. You don't, you don't notice any of it. What, what you do notice is you're thinking about I got to get, I got to boil some water and I, I got to get the chickpeas and, um, and then I'll put the tomato paste in and, you know, whatever else it is that you're doing. And all, all, all of the, all of the stuff on the shelves, you know, and all of the windows and whatever else, those things kind of disappear. Uh, they can be there if you, if you, if, if something catches your attention and you look up, but they kind of disappear. And what's, what your experience is about is the thing you're working on just like that woman in the Jeff Wall image the view from an apartment you know is reading the magazine and what she's engaged with is what the story in the magazine is about and she doesn't even really notice the words on the page or her hands holding the magazine or the feel of the couch behind her back well similarly when you're in the kitchen like your mind is on the special chickpea pasta dish you're cooking for supper or something like that and as the issues in the carrying out of that task sort of unfold and develop, things come to your mind. Oh, I need I need a knife. Oh, I need uh, I need to get some water in this pot. I need uh, a spoon. And as the task calls for a spoon, your hand rises to the task and reaches over to the drawer and pulls it open. And your other hand goes in and grabs the spoon. And then you go back and stir. Right? That drawer was hidden before in the not 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 in the sense that somebody had put a black blanket over it it was totally available in terms of the sensory impact on the optic nerve and whatever else um but it but it was not uh it was not um noteworthy or noticeable object in your experience it was just like part of the kind of black neutral background but when you needed the spoon suddenly the drawer come is is alive to you and whatever else you were dealing with before kind of disappears and your perception is really uh um uh specified may become specific in its in its engagement with the details of the thing and your hand goes out and pulls it open and so on and you know so when you need the spoon the drawer is ready for you. It's, it's, it's available. It's like it's lying in wait, ready to pop into significance uh, when, when you need it. But normally it just lies there hidden. But when you need it, whoop, it's the salient thing. You find it and you get the spoon. But then it disappears again and you're back stirring, you know. So I want you to think perceptually about what that, or experientially about what that uh, activity of cooking is like, the practice of cooking, and, and think about what it's actually like to live in that environment. What are the things of that environment like? Now, an outside observer who's not cook, not cooking can look at it and could give you an inventory of all the things in the room, right? So I'm not asking you for that when I'm asking you what the things are. I'm asking you from the point of view of describing the form your experience actually takes. What are the things like? Um, most things are hidden. Uh, and some things rise 
to prominence. But even there, they don't rise to prominence as particularly objects of your attention. The spoon rises to prominence not because you want to stare at a spoon and think about spoons, but because you want to stir. So your very relationship to the spoon keeps that spoon kind of um, subordinated in its meaning, in its, in its experiential meaning, to the task you're involved in, right? What your experience is about is stirring. And your hand and the spoon become part of that experience as they're needed. And so hand and spoon become meaningful elements of your experience, but not because hand as such and spoon as such is what you're concerned about. No, you're concerned about stirring. They come into being exactly as he says, as equipment. They come into being as the relevant, ready means for addressing the issue that needs to be addressed in the task you're involved in. And to a large extent, these things can happen without you ever even thinking about it, right? You might very well be talking to someone on the phone while this is happening or daydreaming about what you're going to do on your date this evening after supper or steaming over how angry you are at the way your mom just talked to you or whatever it is, right? You, uh, You could be doing all kinds of things. Uh, you could be reflecting on all kinds of things, uh, but your behavior is still very intelligent, right? And as you know, you're talking, you taste this, and it's it's a it's not salty enough, and you reach out and get the salt. You know, you you make all the appropriate dis- discriminations in in the environment that are reflective of a highly intelligent and a highly thoughtful perspective, right? It's not you're not running on. Um, uh, programs, you know, algorithms, you know, you're not running on prefabricated things that just make this happen to make this happen to make this happen. This you're ongoingly involved in a kind of choice in a kind of discrimination, but it's not going, it's not being processed reflectively such that you, you might not even be meaningfully aware that you're doing it. You, and so su- subsequently you might not remember what you did because you weren't, you as a reflective self weren't really there when it was happening. But you were doing that, right? So, so we're talking about the form your experience takes, and the the most basic form your experience takes in its inhabitation of the world is an ongoing practical engagement with things that reflects a kind of lived know-how, and those things are fundamentally experienced as equipment, uh, which means they're not experienced as isolated, de- detached objects of interest. It means they're experienced as part of a network of things that are involved in the in the available resources for carrying out a task, um, and that's why he says, <coughs> excuse me, in the next paragraph on seven ninety seven, taken strictly, there is no such thing as an equipment. Uh, he says to the being of any equipment, there always belongs a totality of equipment. Yeah, because because there there are a network of things that come into play in the carrying out of a task, and there they. The equipment has its role as part of a system of resources for doing the kinds of things you do. Um, so that's a quick description of um, the basic experience of things in your in your everyday inhabitation of a of a familiar environment. Um, and let's carry on a little bit farther. Um, Actually, let me just read this one line. I wasn't going to read this, but I just noticed it on 98. I think it's helpful to what we might go on and say later. He says, the second line on 98, when we in, what we encounter is closest to us, though not as something taken as a theme, right? So it's, it's, it's what we're most intimately involved with, but we're not actually typically noticing it. It's not thematic. It's not, it's not the, uh, the explicit focus of our attention. Uh, what we encounter is closest to us, though not as something taken as a theme, is, for example, the room. And we... I encounter the room that I inhabit, like the woman in that um, Jeff Wall image, view from an apartment. Uh, I encounter it not as something between four walls in a geometrical spatial sense, but I encounter it as equipment for residing. So these things I'm saying about equipment, uh, you could go back and, and read those back into that woman in relationship to the couch, the floor, the general feel of the room, and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, so then he says... Equipment can genuinely show itself only in dealings cut to its own measure, hammering with a hammer, for example. In other words, inasmuch as the reality of this thing experientially is that it it is equipment, 
you're really grasping it for what it is and knowing it for what it is when you use it in the in the way that fits its its equipmental nature so you you know a hammer as a hammer when when you use it in hammering right the the knowing the thing for what it is doesn't come through a sort of theoretical cognition of it it comes through letting it be the thing it is through through using it through through um, participating with it in the activity, which it basically allows it to sort of re release and um, reveal its nature, to realize its nature. Um, and as he says, just read a little more from that paragraph. Um, well, and anyway, so he says there, you know a hammer as a hammer in hammering, and that's pointedly not th a thematic perception, right? Because you're oriented towards putting the board up on the wall and getting the nail in. So you know the hammer as a hammer when you don't notice it, but use it in a way that is subordinated to the task of, of putting the painting up on the wall. Um, and that's why he says a couple of lines later, in dealings such as this, uh, where something is put to use, our concern subordinates itself to the in order to, which is constitutive for the equipment we are employing at the time, right? The thing you're trying to do is put the painting up. So everything that you're going to do is in order to get that painting up. And so you experience the hammer as a hammer because, because in its very meaning, it is subordinated to the task of putting the painting up, right? So, so it, it is properly grasped insofar as it is overlooked, uh, uh, not in the sense of being ignored and left behind, but in the sense of being looked past and, and uh, towards the thing you're working on and used to that end. Um, and so he says, the kind of being that equipment possesses and in which it manifests itself in its own right is what we will call readiness to hand, to hand and height. So we're, I've used the word ready a few times in talking already. already, um, And that's the first idea that we, the first big idea we really want to bring out here, right? So what is our experience like? It's a matter of inhabiting a world. What is it like to inhabit a world? It's to relate to something that f that is familiar and that therefore fundamentally has the character for you of readiness. It's 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 at the ready to rise to cooperate with you in allowing the projects you're engaged in to be accomplished. Um, that's what I want from section 15. Now I want to skip ahead to section 16, and. Uh, um, and so uh, he says, the section 16 is called How the Worldly Character of the Environment Announces Itself in Entities Within the World. Um, so what he wants to talk about here is, 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 is how your perception of these things is, in an interesting way can change. So he says, um, this is on page 102, about seven lines up from the bottom, seven or eight lines. He says, here, here's something that can happen. When we concern ourselves with something, Concern being that word he's using for um, the attitude we bring to a functional, practical engagement with our familiar environment. Uh, when we concern ourselves with something, the entities which are most closely ready to hand, which is what we've been talking about, the equipment, may be met as something unusable, not properly adapted for the use we have decided upon. Right, so that's kind of interesting. Sometimes you might uh, want want to be uh, hammering, for example, and uh, you go go to the toolbox as you always do while you're still talking on the phone or whatever, and you look around and you pick up the hammer. And you notice, oh darn, the the handle's broken. I can't use that. So suddenly, the equipment you go for is unusable. Um, uh, and he says, when its unusability is thus discovered, equipment becomes conspicuous. So this is, but the interesting thing that characterizes the spoon you're stirring with, the drawer the spoon was in, all those other things we talked about, or the hammer in your toolbox that you normally turn to, is that equipment, things that are characterized by readiness to hand, are typically characterized by being inconspicuous. That's to, that is to say, they don't rise to the point of catching your attention and getting you to focus on them. You can look past them. But what happens when you go to rely on that thing and it's broken is it becomes conspicuous. Um, 
Yeah, when, the, when its unusability is thus discovered, equipment becomes conspicuous. Uh, and then he says about five more lines down, pure presence at hand announces itself in such equipment. Yeah, because suddenly you say, oh, there's a thing there. Uh, but it's kind of a dead, inert thing from the point of view of my experience. It now becomes an object you can look at, but it's been severed from its functional connection with your task. So there, uh, there you're, you're now relating to things in the world. You're still relating to things in the world, but you're relating to them in a really different way than you did before. Formerly, you related to things in the sense of practical know-how that sort of worked through those things so as to be able to fulfill your own tasks. Now you're relating to something as an alien thing that catches your attention in its own right and you stare at. So it's now present to you as opposed to being ready for you. It has become literally an object. It's a thing uh, etymologically, literally, but means a thing thrown in front of you or thrown in your way. But I, I mean, it is now the object of your attention. Whereas the equipment was, the, the thing as equipment was not the object of your attention. Your object when you were hammering was the painting going up on the wall. The object when the woman was reading the journal was the story that was being told. But suddenly when there are, uh, I don't know, the print on the page doesn't work right or there are some words missing in the sentence, the words don't work anymore and in their unusability she looks at them and she noticed them as words and she says what word is that you know so then the word has become an object rather than the inconspicuous means by which she engaged with her object which was the story and similarly when the hammer breaks the hammer becomes your object rather than what it formerly was namely the inconspicuous means by which you were enabled to engage with your object which was the hanging of the picture right so in the breakdown of equipment, we discover a new way we can relate to the world. We can stare at it. And, and so that is the way we typically think of um, reality in general, right? So going back to the seeing yourself reflected in the um, mirror, at the f in the painting at the Folie Bergère, um, I was saying, you know... Um, there you're you're encountering yourself as an object uh, but that's and that's typically how we think of everything it's like a thing in the world alien to us that we see um, and I was trying to get you to notice before that that's not your living sense of yourself typically and now the thing that Heidegger is trying to get you to see here is that's not even your typical sense of things in the world you don't encounter things in the world as objects really until your living relationship with them breaks down. So the objecthood of the world is experientially and ontologically secondary to a more basic experiential reality, uh, uh, which is um, experiencing things as home, where the world be uh, is the inconspicuous realm of resources for the fulfillment of your tasks um yeah uh, let me just so that that's the big point i'm just going to say one more thing so i want to read another sentence on page 104 um so he, he, he actually in in this section he brings out a few different ways that that the readiness to hand can break down like the, the hammer can be missing or uh, sorry it can be broken or it can be missing uh or something can there can be an obstacle in your way but but he, so he says the modes of conspicuousness which are obtrusiveness obstinacy sorry the modes of conspicuousness obtrusiveness and obstinacy all have the function of bringing to the fore the characteristic of presence at hand in what is or was ready to hand so the, the thing I, w I wanted to bring out there just in that sentence in relationship to the point i just made is the things become present through a kind of operation being performed on things that are ready um, and uh, so our fundamental engagement with the world is that one of familiar inhabitation with a home, a ready home. And the world becomes objective through something of a breakdown in that kind of a home relationship. 
uh, that's that's the experiential reality. The way we tend to think about things has it backwards. Uh, we tend to think of the world as an alienated object as if that's just the way things are and that's where we start from and we try to explain ourselves and our experience on the basis of that. So, so the real revolution in thinking that Heidegger's trying to, to bring about is by describing our experience and recognizing in contrast to our ordinary view the primacy, the originality of the inhabitation of the world and all, uh, and, and all the, the, the different dimensions that has. Um, so I'm going to leave it there for now, but that's, that's our first most basic point about Heidegger, um, uh, primarily found in this uh, Division One, Chapter 3, uh, but I've drawn on a few other texts as well. Uh, but that's the notion we need to take forward. We're, so we're taking forward the notion of being in the world that we're especially understanding in light of the notion of inhabitation, which is, which is the name for how we are relating to the world, and in the correlated notion of readiness, which is how the world is experienced in that relationship of inhabitation. Uh, so let's leave it there for, for now, and then we'll uh, move on to a new subject next time.